Coming to you live from Champion Studio in Charleston, South Carolina. It is better than ever live wherever you're watching or wherever you're listening. I hope you're making today your masterpiece. My name is Dr. David Geyer, orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine specialist, and media medical expert. My goal is to help you feel and perform your best regardless of age, injury, or any medical condition you might have. I hope you're having a terrific, terrific day on this Thursday afternoon here on the East Coast, Thursday morning on the West Coast. Very excited that you are here. I'd love to hear from you. We have a lot of great topics to get to today, so if you have comments on any of those, I would love to hear those. Please put your first name. Please put where you're from. I would love to hear that. Remember, this is not specific medical advice. I am not your doctor. You're my patient. Everything we talk about here, all these studies on exercise and sleep and being safe and all sorts of good stuff here, this is not medical advice. It's meant for general information and educational purposes only. Uh, remember as well, and I'll mention this Hello, Robert. Good seeing you. I will mention this again at the end of the show. I mentioned it Tuesday. Tomorrow, noon, I am starting Ask Dr. Geyer segments on this show, Better Than Ever Live. So yes, we have a bonus Friday episode at 12 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. So if you have questions about any of this health and wellness stuff or maybe a topic related to a bone injury, joint injury, muscle tendon, something like that, some orthopedic problem, some sports medicine type of question, send those as well. All right, let's start with something that I care a lot about. I mean, obviously I care about a lot of this, but as people who know me well, they, they know personally very well. If you've ever seen the counter in my bathroom, I have literally what some would describe as a truckload of supplements on my bathroom counter. Uh, it's crazy. I, it, I don't know how many it is. I'm guessing 10, maybe 12. I don't know. And that doesn't include some of the medications I take. It, it's a lot. Some are brain supplements, some, you know, the nootropics, some are sleep supplements. I have an anti-anxiety supplement. Let's see, what else? There's a bunch. Fish oil, vitamin D, all these different things. And I am not alone. Maybe I'm unique in how many of them I take. Uh, but 73% of American adults take supplements on a regular basis. So obviously, this is something very important. And this is a big deal for a number of reasons. One, there's roughly 80,000 different dietary supplements out there. It's hard to know because there's not a comprehensive database. There are some voluntary databases, but companies aren't obligated to put their supplement in it. But more importantly, supplements are not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. And so this becomes a problem, and they're not regulated by uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture either. So it's hard to know daily limits. We'll talk a little bit about that. But then it's hard to know when you buy them how safe they are. And here's some of the issues. One, the FDA is not reviewing them before, the, before they go to market. A company can basically create something, put it on Amazon, put it on their website, and the FDA has never reviewed it. The only time the FDA can do anything about a supplement is if it's found to be unsafe or if there's mislabeled, you know, basically claims that aren't really true. You can't put something on uh, Amazon about your supplement preventing COVID because you honestly can't say that you can prevent or treat any kind of disease. Now, the problem with that is the FDA only takes action after there's been a claim. So in theory, something could be out there and people take it and then only then can the FDA step in. So in theory, they could be harmful. The reason I bring this up is there is a new scorecard, the OPSS scorecard. The Department of Defense created the Operation Supplement Safety Program, and they created a, a scorecard, seven questions, yes or no answers. And basically, you want uh, seven yeses to these questions, and this would help you determine if something is safe. Um, the uh, I will completely... Uh, bet that most of the people listening, because if you're listening or watching the show, you care about health and wellness. And so I bet a lot of you take supplements. But 
Uh, and I've got some thoughts on where you should get them and where you shouldn't get them. But let's talk about this sco scorecard because this is very simple. Uh, I really need to write this up uh, in a checklist form, put it on my website. But here are the seven questions. One, is there a third party certification seal on the label? And they, they suggest four. And these are voluntary third party testings. BSCG, NSF, U, USP, which is the one I think I've seen the most, and Informed Sport. They bas basically test these products to see if they actually contain the supplement that's mentioned. And that's one of the big problems. And I'll say this again at the end. I am not a big fan of people getting supplements on Amazon over and over. So many of these have been tested and they don't even contain what the container says. So third-party voluntary certifications, BSCG, NSF, USP, or Informed Sport. If it has it, it's a yes. Definitely very good. Question number two, are there fewer than six ingredients on the label, on the supplement facts? Um, doesn't absolutely mean if there's like 10 or 12 that it's bad, but generally these supplements shouldn't have lots of fillers and other pro uh, products in it. And a lot of times what's in it, they, it can counteract with each other leading to side effects. So you want fewer than six ingredients. All right, question number three. And I actually used to take a, a, a brain supplement, a nootropic that, that did this. Is the label free of the words proprietary, blend, matrix, or complex? Generally, they feel that's bad because it allows manufacturers to sort of hide what's in that complex. You can just list a number of milligrams of a complex and not the individual, well, you have to list the individual ingredients in that blend, that proprietary complex, whatever the, the thing is, but then you don't have to say how much of it is in that complex. It's just a way for manufacturers to be very gray uh, about that. All right, number four, can you easily pronounce the names of each ingredient on the supplement facts label. That is actually a good test for how healthy the food you're eating from the grocery store is. You should be able to pronounce every label in the ingredients or every ingredient in the on the label. All right, with supplements, I get that some of them are gonna be amino acids and they may be a li little complicated, but they shouldn't be complex chemical sounding things like steroids or pharmaceuticals. That should be a dead giveaway. Mostly it should be a vitamin, mineral, herb, or botanical those you can generally pronounce, all right? So if you can pronounce everything, that's definitely good. Number, another one that doesn't get a lot of attention, you want it to have, or the question is, is the amount of caffeine on the label 200 milligrams or less? A lot of supplement makers put caffeine in it because it makes you feel good. And then you think, all right, the supplement must be doing something. So you want 200 milligrams or less. Number four, is the label free of questionable claims and statements? Again, dietary supplement makers are not allowed to say that it prevents this disease or treats this condition. That's why a lot of times you'll say supports heart health or supports healthy bones or things like that. You don't want anything questionable on there. And then the last one, and this is probably the one that I, if there's gonna be one I disagree with a little bit, it would be this one. Are all the percent daily values on the supplement facts label less than 200%? In this, it gets into why it's set at 200%. Basically, the National Institute, National Institutes of Health, the NIH, set, sets a sort of an upper limit, the highest intake without risk of side effects, and then the daily recommended value is half that. That's where that comes from. There are some that I would argue is probably not a bad idea. Sometimes it could actually be beneficial to exceed that. I know that there's a lot of debate about how much vitamin D is okay, and most, or a lot of physicians at least, think that the recommended daily allowance of vitamin D is way too low. Uh, but having said that, 200%. So those were the questions. Go through those again really quickly. Is there a third party certification on the label? Less than six ingredients. Free, the label doesn't say anything about a proprietary blend or complex. Can you pronounce each ingredient's name? Less than 200 milligrams of caffeine. The label does not have questionable health claims or statements. And the percent daily value is of any supplement less than 200%. So for what it's worth, here's my thing about, and somebody mentioned Amazon, I was gonna point that up here. Um, Amazon is just a marketplace. It is not 
I mean, yeah, they make a few products, but generally, especially with health products, it is a marketplace. It is a place where people sell things, a place where people buy things. And I love Amazon. I buy all kinds of stuff from them just because it's a pain to get it at the store. I get it. Supplements, though, my issue is one, um, a whole lot of these, then this has been shown in other studies, a whole lot of the supplement makers that, that sell on Amazon, the product comes from China. I already told you very, very often it doesn't actually have that supplement ingredient in it, but also it's filled with tons of fillers and some of that could be dangerous. I'm not a big fan of Amazon and that's not to say anything bad about Amazon, that's just the nature of it. There are very reputable labs. In fact, my practice sells a lot of supplements. We use one lab in particular where all of it has been tested. Everything that's in it has been tested. It's very pure and that's uh, all it has. And then it uh, doesn't have a bunch of fillers or things that are potentially harmful. So you pay a little bit more for that. Another problem with Amazon too, why the supplements are so cheap. And I get that they're cheaper on Amazon than any other place. But two, very often, supposedly this has been studied, those supplements have badly expired. They just take them out of the package, put it in another package, and then sell it for cheaper. That Quality supplements, quality nutrients in your body are probably gonna cost a little bit more. So again, not so much specifically about Amazon because it's just a marketplace. It's the sellers on Amazon. So that's something to think about. All right. Pivoting a little bit, but not completely, and we're gonna talk about antibiotics. Now, one of the concerns that a lot of us that do uh, medicine, but you know, sort of get it, you know, a little bit into the functional integrative medicine is that there is way, there are way too many antibiotics being used in this country. I mean, sometimes you need it. You have like a, a deep infection, you're trying to get rid of it. I mean, there's, there are good reasons for antibiotics but not to treat colds and all this kind of stuff. Way too many antibiotics. And one of the concerns with antibiotics generally is that they can disrupt your gut flora, the bacteria in your gut. You know, we have 40 trillion bacteria in our gut and it, it's not just helping to digest food. It plays a role in our uh, you know, weight loss and obesity and it's actually thought to be very, very important to our immune system. So there's a new study that came out in the journal Nature. A German team studied 144 antibiotics to see what effect they had on their gut health. And they found that two classes of, anti of antibiotics basically destroyed about half the normal gut bacteria, leaving it more common. You get a condition called C. diff, or the fancy term for that is chloris Clostridia, I'm not even going to try to say it, difficile, diarrhea, nausea, fever, stomach pain can even kill you. Here are your two classes of antibiotics. One, tetracyclines, uh, they're a broad uh, spectrum antibiotic, and then macrolids, the, the common one that people have out of that group is erythromycin. These uh, did kill the bacteria for whatever they were being treated, but they stopped good bacteria from growing. It actually got rid of about half of your normal gut bacteria. Now that's not to say you should stop those particular classes of antibiotics, but if you go see a doctor, talk to that doctor about, hey, you know, will this interfere with my gut bacteria? Can I try a different type? But here is why I brought all of this up. If you're on antibiotics, it's probably not a bad idea to try to do what you can to restore your no normal gut flora, your normal gut uh, microbiome. And that involves prebiotics and probiotics. Now there are supplements to do that, but there are actually foods that are really good for that purpose. And what I would tell you there, and I was just talking about this with somebody a couple days ago, it's really funny that this comes up. Um, try fermented foods. And what we're talking about there, sauerkraut, kimchi, which I would love to get started on. I've, I've never had kimchi, but that's something I wouldn't mind taking a few times a week. Uh, and then yogurt. Now try to avoid the heavy sugar yogurts, but those all can have probiotics and can help restore your gut bacteria. So if you have to be on antibiotics for some reason, maybe consider adding a little bit of that to your diet. Speaking of your immune system, one of the potential risks of losing a lot of weight would be that it potentially could hurt your immune system, make it more likely you suffer infections and illnesses. A new study in the American Journal of Translational Research says that significant calorie 
restriction may hurt your immune system. What they did, 29 females that were overweight, they had a body mass index over 29. So 30 is the cutoff the American Heart Association sets as obesity, a BMI of 30. So they had 29 women, put them in one of two groups. One was a control group, they could eat whatever they want. The experimental group, was basically losing weight by two means. One, they were put on a weight loss medication, and two, they had their diet cut by 600 calories a day. And not surprisingly, the experimental group lost 10% of their body weight. But both groups, the researchers measured the, the blood of both groups looking for white blood cell counts. These are the cells in your blood that fight infection. And what they were looking at are a type of white blood cell called lymphocytes. These are the killer cells. You hear killer T cells. Those are lymphocytes. And in the group that underwent the calorie restriction and medication to lose weight, they had a significant reduction in their lymphocytes compared to the people that didn't lose weight. Now, I am not gonna be on the, well, that's gonna be our excuse, we can't lose weight. That's not what I would say at all with this. Losing weight is certainly a good thing, but I would argue slow, steady approaches to losing weight are what you wanna do. Starving yourself or taking a bunch of medications or something to significantly drop your weight loss or your weight very quickly, that may have a negative effect on your health. But slow, steady modifications, adding more fruits and vegetables, getting a little bit more exercise, and all the different things that, you know, cutting processed foods to slowly cut a pound a, you know, a week, something like that, Probably, yeah, it may have a small effect on your, your immune system, but it, it will respond rather than a crash diet that could be really bad. All right, one of the issues, and it's funny, I, I'm going to my doctor later today and I'll, I'll see all my, I got blood work drawn a few weeks ago, but in the past, I have had issues with my cortisol levels. It's a stress hormone, we've talked about it here. When you have a, an acute stress, you're running from a dangerous animal or something, your cortisol spikes up, that's fine. That you know, you know, jacks up your uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine, which are good, they're fight or flight hormones, helps you take action, avoid the dangerous animal, whatever it is. But you want those to go away really quickly. You don't want them chronically elevated. And one of the problems with workplace stress, emotional, you know, romantic stress, relationship stress, is that you have tend to have very chronically high elevated cortisol levels. And that was especially a problem. I talked about this a lot on TV, uh, the two TV stations I work with. Uh, mental health was really bad during the pandemic and, and may still be. And so these people have chronically high levels of stress and cortisol levels. So there's a, a new book out written by a, a doctor, Dr. Elaine Chin, and she offers five ways to get your cortisol under control to improve your stress. And a few of these make sense and a few of these you probably haven't thought of. One, get a massage. I was just saying earlier this week to somebody, I badly need to start doing this. It was one of my patients in clinic and he gave me a, a name of, of somebody to try, but mine's because I've really ramped up my workouts and so I hurt all the time, quite honestly, but getting a massage decreases cortisol 31%, but it also increases your serotonin, which is your happy hormone, so to speak, and your dopamine, which is sort of your love and satisfaction hormone, it increases those significantly. So getting a massage, one way. Another way to start meditating. This has been the bane of my existence because I have apps on my phone. I've got devices to help me meditate, like the Muse Band. Those of you guys know that you put the band on and it plays birds. If you're actually, you know, counting your breaths and listening, you know, based on biofeedback, it tracks your brain waves and then it gives you like a thunderstorm if you're not meditating. It's pretty cool, but I have all this stuff. I don't do it. I've got to start meditating, but that definitely good for lowering your stress. Here are two you probably haven't thought of. Pet therapy. We know that people who have pets, especially dogs, they tend to be happier, better moods, just overall have better health, better uh, mental well-being. But also what's being looked at is bringing pets into retirement homes, into nursing homes, into hospitals to help people de-stress and just feel better. Pets improve life satisfaction in older adults, decrease depression in older adults, in college students, Pets improve positive emotions, reduce negative emotions, and lower perceived stress. So I think that's fantastic. Another one, so pets you may not have thought of, another one, art. That's right, 
Go to these places, these businesses around town where you pay a certain amount of money and you learn to paint a painting. Sometimes they give you wine or something like that. And at least when I do it, it turns out horribly because I have zero artistic ability, but it's still fun. But it doesn't have to be crayons or paint or anything, clay, things like that. Cooking is a type of art, so take a cooking class. One of the interesting things in COVID-19 early on is that so many ingredients in the grocery store like flour and sugar and things that you use to bake and make foods were really low. And the thought is that was one of the things people did as a new activity during the pandemic is they started cooking again. So cooking could be another type of art to help you lower your cortisol. And last, I've mentioned this in other realms before, Get outside, get in nature. Nature, and, and I don't know, it doesn't really get into, is it the sunlight, is it the, you know, the vitamin D from that, is it the fresh air? But nature has been shown in multiple, multiple domains to be good for your mental health and looks like in this way, lowers your stress, helps with your cortisol. So of those, real quickly, massage, meditating, pet therapy, art therapy, time in nature, I am a big, Ofer, I am O for five. And I bet all of those except maybe the art or things that I've talked about within the last week is something I needed to do. And heck, art, I'm all for that as well. All right, here's one real quick. I think this is interesting. Nobody else is gonna find this interesting. Um, a new study looked at brain activity. They, they took, did MRIs of 30 people as they fell asleep and just monitored their brain activity. And you know, we used to think our brains kind of slow down when we sleep. Apparently that is actually, it's not even close to the truth. Our brains are hyperactive almost as we're asleep, especially as we're going from light sleep to deep, uh, deep sleep, our brains really start revving up. What happens though, what they found that's really interesting is the different regions of the brain aren't able to network and communicate with each other, which may explain issues with your state of consciousness in various phases of sleep. Nothing to act on here. I just think it's really interesting. I, I expect that in the coming years, what we're gonna see, or especially for people that struggle to sleep, is we're gonna get these devices that you can wear on your head to try to influence your brain activity, your brain patterns while you sleep. Ask me in a year or two, three years, probably not even that long. It may already be out there. If it is, somebody mention it in the comments. Uh, that is coming, I have no doubt. All right, one of the problems when people sleep, if you talk to people, you go out on a Friday night, you have three or four drinks, and then that night you don't sleep all that well. And was it the alcohol or was it that you also ate a bunch of junk food while you were eating and then your sleep's bad? Or is it that your sleep, you didn't sleep really well and so I'm gonna eat a bunch of junk, you almost use it as an excuse. And it's hard to know. There was a new study uh, out of Finland, Finland researchers, they took 252 people who were overweight monitored their sleep, monitored their eating, monitored their alcohol, and lo and behold, guess what you would find out? If you eat a healthy diet, basically low in processed foods, which I talk about all the time, and eat more whole plant-based foods and drink less alcohol, guess what? You tend to have better sleep than people who don't do that. And what's interesting is people that eat a better diet and consume less alcohol have more parasympathetic activity while they sleep. This is sort of the feel-good system. You, the sympathetic is the fight or flight. The parasympathetic is sort of the recovery phase. So the more parasympathetic time you have when you sleep, the better you recover while you're asleep. And what leads to more parasympathetic activity while you sleep? More vegetables, more fruits, less processed foods, and unfortunately, for some people at least, less alcohol. So think about that. If you wanna wake up feeling rested the next day, eat a healthy diet the day before, try to limit your alcohol. All right, social media. I talked about this on TV this week, and I, and I don't know how many this surprises. You know, when the Facebook whistleblower, and I can't think of her name off the top of my head, she was on 60 Minutes, testified in front of Congress, has testified in Europe about some of the issues with Facebook. One of the concerns was marketing to kids. And I, this isn't about Facebook specifically, but one of the reactions to her was, oh my gosh, we can't have kids seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old using social media. Well, 
New study out of the University of Michigan, their children's hospital, they did a national poll on children's health. They polled over a thousand parents who had a child between the age of seven and 12. And what they found out is half among kids that were 10 to 12 years old, half of them engaged with other people on social media. Looking at uh, kids that were seven to nine, a third, over a third of them engaged with other people on social media. Hopefully they're friends, other youngsters and not adults. That's kind of creepy. But here's where it's really interesting. So two thirds of the parents said they're worried about their kids sharing information online. What's interesting is almost none of them did anything about it. So 20% uh, said they couldn't even figure out how to set up parental controls. 40% said it was too time consuming to set up parental controls. And a third said parental controls are a waste of time because the kids would just figure out their way around them. So I don't know, it concerns me seven, eight year old kids being able to do whatever they want on social media because again, these things, people can act like other people, it just makes me really nervous. So the bottom line to me is we need to talk to our kids. Yeah, yeah, there's the setting time limits. I've talked about all that before. But talk about you know who they should engage with, who they shouldn't. Teach them about what to look out for. And then, yeah, think about setting up parental controls. And then last, I'm going to get to, this is, what is today? The 28th, I think, is today. <laughs> I'm bad with dates this week. So... Today's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday is Halloween, three days from now. But all weekend, it's going to be Halloween parties and all sorts of Halloween festivities. Let's do a little talk about Halloween. I talked about this on a radio show yesterday. Uh, the host got a kick out of some of my tips uh, to have a healthy Halloween. And, and some of this is directed at kids, but I'll throw some adult stuff in here too. Some tips for how you can be a little bit healthier this weekend. And this is the one that the radio show host loved. Rather than having your kids skip dinner and then just just get, just <laughs> eating handfuls and handfuls of candy, maybe have them eat dinner before you go. And this is tricky because I don't know where you are, but it seems like kids trick or treat so early in my neighborhood. It, you know, five o'clock, 5.30, I mean, it's not even close to dark, and there's probably safety issues, and Sunday it'll be a school night, I get it, but try to get them to have dinner. That's a good, actually, rule of thumb. If you're ever going to a dinner party or somewhere where there may be bad foods, have dinner before you go, and then you can eat less, you know, and avoid the bad foods, and you don't spend your time eating, you actually talk to other people, but have your kids eat before you go. Another one. Pick a small container, and this is a bummer because when I was a kid, we used the pillowcases. I mean, yeah, there were the little pumpkin-like thing, plastic things, but they were kind of small. You could put a ton in a pillowcase. Don't do that. Smaller containers for your kids. Encourage your kids to only have one piece of candy. Good luck with that, but here's what this article that I read says. Tell them that if they only take one piece of candy from each house, they'll be able to visit more houses in the neighborhood. So if you have really gullible kids, tell them that. Come on, knock that, that's, that's idiotic. How much harder is it to grab three or four pieces out of one thing than one, that doesn't make any sense. But try to get them to only have one piece of candy at each house. Now this is a good one. If you're gonna do trick or treating, walk instead of riding what happens in my neighborhood, you're gonna learn that I have this thing against golf carts. Um, don't do the golf cart thing. Actually, everybody walk. The walking is good for you, but make a game out of it. Split into two teams. See who can go to the most houses. That's actually a pretty good idea. I like that a lot. And then discuss ahead of time, not while the candy is all on the counter, but ahead of time, how many pieces that they're going to eat on any given night, one, two, three, and how many days before you get rid of all of it, taking it to work or sending it to the troops or things like that. If you discuss that on the front end, might be a little better off. And then if you're having a party, serve some healthy foods. You can make them Halloween themed, I'm all for that, but you know, maybe not as much candy and, and processed foods. Make healthy stuff. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of that. 
Do activities for the kids at the party that are physical, you know, running around, three-legged races, you know, any of that kind of stuff. I don't even know the games these young kids play anymore, but physical ones, certainly good. And try maybe not to serve so many soft drinks and maybe 100% fruit juices, waters, things like that. And if you're one of the people, one of the adults passing out candy, don't eat it yourself. Don't, all right, I just gave one, now I get to have one or anything like that. Try your best not to eat it yourself. And last, let's talk about haunted houses, for real. So I, I did a, I talked about this on the radio and I also talked about this on TV this week. Uh, apparently, going to haunted houses might be good for you. And, and not, not just haunted houses, but any scary experience. Roller coasters, scary movies, things like that. There's a study done, University of Pittsburgh, they looked at what's called, let me read this to you, voluntary arousing negative experiences. They took 262 adults and had them go to haunted attractions, basically haunted houses, and they they monitored their moods and, and um, a variety of different um, emotions, and then they also did brain scans. And what they found out is that basically for almost everybody that did the haunted house, they're, they're mood, their affect actually got better, but especially if they were people were bored, tired, or stressed before the haunted house. And what they basically figured out was that if you go put yourself in a scary situation voluntarily and then get out of it, it creates a physiological and neurological response similar to a runner's high. Anybody that's ever run and then they get that just rush of endorphins after they feel great, that was actually one of the few things I liked about running for all the years that I ran. I did love the runner's high. That's exactly what for so many people going to a haunted house does for you. So if you're having a bad weekend this weekend, you might think about going to a haunted house. Mercy says, hello. Um, Robert, I take 5,000 I use a vitamin D. It says 625% on the bottle. Yeah, I know people that are recommending now, in fact, an orthopedic surgeon that does what I do, which is also functional and integrative medicine, things like peptides and PRP and exosomes and things like that. She recommends 10,000 I use a vitamin D. I, I agree, Robert, I take 5,000. There's not a right answer. I know if you talk to most doctors, they'll say 1,000, maybe 2,000, but the American population by and large is vitamin D deficient. There was a study of the New York Giants sometime in the last decade. A professional football team, 81% of the players were deficient in vitamin D. Now, you could say that's because it's a majority of, of black players and they tend to have lower vitamin D levels because they're not able to absorb it from the sun as well. But still, vitamin D is a big deal. But t be very careful about where you get your supplements. Thank you so much for joining us. Join us tomorrow. If you've got a health question, wellness question, exercise, sleep, any nutrition, any of this kind of stuff, I'd love to answer those. If you have a bone or joint question, you know, maybe you got hurt or your kids got hurt. I can't give you medical advice tomorrow, but I can at least address those topics and give thoughts on treatments and that kind of thing. So ask Dr. Geyer live, 12 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. I will uh, answer some of those questions. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. If you're not here tomorrow, that's fine. And that will not be put on a podcast. That is just going to be live. YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Dr. David Geyer. Click the bell and you'll be notified. Facebook.com forward slash Dr. David Geyer and LinkedIn. It'll be live on those three, but there will not be a recording that goes into the podcast form. So if you're listening to this on podcast and you have those kind of questions, join us live tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching. If you don't attend tomorrow, I hope you have a wonderful and safe and healthy 